I'm just going to start because I don't know what's going on, but um, so I had a, I think a hard time after having heard a lot of these presentations that we've done over the week. Um, I, I kind of, I wanted to switch this up a little bit, so it might be kind of clunky, maybe. Um, and also in, in, you know, considering the time we have left, so I wanted to make this a little shorter too. Anyways, really what I was going to talk about, it, it, this presentation has two parts to it. The first part, we were going to talk mainly uh, about spillway erosion um, and some of the things that we've seen a lot from Todd and other people at Thule. And, and then the second part was really going to be talking about some strength parameters and how we evaluated those in terms of our risk assessment and stability analysis. I think I'm just going to try and get through the first part in, in talking about the, the properties of the rock and how we use that to evaluate uh, spillway erosion. And then we'll probably just take a pause and, and see where we're at in terms of time. And if, and if we want to dive into anything related to strength and, and um, kind of more like the structural element, uh, is he got clipped up like structural guys? Boom. Um, anyways, we can we can do it if we have time. So here's our learning objectives. Uh, what do I say? Learn through Keystone Dam case history. It's sort of a case history mixed with a little bit of um, kind of as I did to develop this uh, site characterization uh, through the case history of the importance of targeted field investigations to inform risk and, and selection of recommended modifications to reduce the risk on the project. So here's our stuff that we're going to talk about. We'll go through, through some background. The brief risk history is mainly there to bring us kind of like explain how we got to where we're at. Monolith sliding failure mode. I'm going to show the whole failure mode. The two parts of it that we're really going to talk about is just that foundation erosion part. It's kind of like two nodes. And then the sliding and rock strength was the, was the last, the second part of this talk, which we might not get to. So we'll see. Um, talk some about the foundation properties and then maybe some key takeaways and discussion. So here's our background. So background info for this dam. So Keystone Dam is located on the Arkansas. It's uh, west of Tulsa. In the picture on the bottom there, you can see what it looks like. It's got a left and a right abutment with that middle uh, orange-ish color thing is the spillway in the center. It's about 1,600 feet wide. The whole dam is, is 121 feet tall. That spillway in the middle consists of 18 uh, 40 by 35 foot tall tainer gates. Built in the 60s, uh, completed in 64, so there's written. The record was 757.2. That was May of 2019. I think the discharge was around 300 CFS, um, 300,000 CFS. So a lot of flow going out of this. Papa Dam elevation was 771. In 2018, they calculated, they being us, uh, calculated a new PFM elevation of 778. So we have a lot of water going over the top of this dam. This is just a typical uh, cross section through the overflow uh, monolith section. There's really just a couple of parts that I wanted to point out on this section. So the, there are things that we're going to talk about later on. So the things are, I'll just start at the bottom. So most of the foundation for this dam consists of shale. I think it's all Pennsylvanian aged, thinly matted, pretty low strength. It has unconfines that go from, say, about 50 PSI, maybe to a high of 1,000 PSI, roughly, maybe just under. The next piece of the foundation we'll talk about a little bit is the sandstone layer. Sandstone in this drawing is, is about four feet thick, but it's really just a sandwich of some interbedded shaley sandstone on top, maybe a foot and a half thick, about a foot and a half thick of that interbedded shaley sandstone on the bottom, kind of with the middle portion of that sandwich uh, consisting of a really high strength, uniform fine grain sandstone. So it's kind of a, a mixed bag. But it forms the foundation for most of the stilling basin slabs over here. There's five or six of them, five or six rows. There are the um, baffle blocks. There's two rows of those. 
The next part of the foundation that we'll talk about a little bit is this passive wedge. Passive wedge is a chunk of the foundation. It, it goes from the heel of the dam out horizontally to some point, and then usually up at some angle, up to, up to daylight there at the toe, and then, and then back in here. So that's the passive wedge portion of the foundation. So when I talk about that, that's what I'm talking about. The stone basin slabs did have some anchors. Um, I, you probably cannot see them, but there are there. Uh, drain holes also. Drain holes were installed through the gallery uh, in the foundation of the monolith also. And I think that might be it. This is just a profile, kind of, kind of just intended to show, it's almost impossible to see on the screen, but this is the heel of the dam. So this rectangular black box here would be the spillway. The heel would be down here. That would be the bottom of the ceiling basin slabs and just intended to show how it kind of uh, changes a little bit of geology there with the sandstone dipping down. Um, well, there is quite a bit of overburden up here also. So this was uh, removed, obviously, for the concrete portion. And then for the embankment portion, it was only removed where they had their core trunk. The rest of it would remain in place. So here's our quick disk history to kind of explain how we got to where we're at. The history of this thing is way earlier than 2018, more like 2005 it started. But in 2018, we had an IES, the initial PFMs, that study was overtopping abutment CLE through the foundation, BEP in the foundation, and then a handful of stability PFMs. Over on the right-hand side of the slide is, is the FN chart for the 2018 issue evaluation study. Here was where that overtopping PFM was plotting, so above our, our societal TRG line there. Because of that, so we launched this into a modification study because of overtopping, which was our main risk driver. During the mod study, they selected a dam raise, which is not surprising, right, for an overtopping problem. And because of that, though, if you raise a dam, you're going to have some other uh, impacts to such things like uh, spillway stability and stilling basin failure modes that were previously excluded. So the, all of those guys were plotting like way down here somewhere. Because of the dam raise and the new, you know, the change, we're going to have to reevaluate those things. So here, here's a, just a quick list of the changes that we're going to have to reevaluate for um, different loading conditions. They're going to consist of higher flows through the basin, higher uplift pressures uh, in the basin, greater chance for sweep out. There's more water going through the spillway, higher stream powers to erode rock, and then higher uh, loading on the foundation also. So, I don't know if you can actually see that, but this is just a generic event tree uh, that goes, uh, that we have for a monolith sliding PFM. We started this guy with our baffle box filling. So, so, the reason we started with this is actually this uh, Keystone Dam, and a lot of districts you'll see share designs. So, Tulsa District had another project, I think it was called Eufaula, with exactly the same design for the baffle blocks. And during 2015, I believe, they actually had baffle blocks uh, fail during that flood. And it was actually a less unit flow than what Keystone would have during uh, high flows for it. So there was a concern that we're going to lose those. So that really starts off our, our event tree here. We lose some baffle blocks. Uh, hydraulic jump sweeps out, so next one, uplift pressures, uh, exceed anchor bars, so we get some uplift. They push the slabs up. Uh, essentially, the slabs get into flow and either fail by stagnation pressure or uplift or both. And then we have some erosion problems. So this is really um, where we're going to be talking about. That's erosion of rock, those nodes six and seven. And then maybe if we want to later, we'll talk about sliding. And then, of course, the last one, breach there is where we take into uh, account all these uh, 3D effects and other things for breach. Okay. So we are going to just step through quickly with a couple of slides what this failure mode looks like. This is slabs uplift into flow. That's this guy right here. So we have uplift beneath slabs, overwhelms existing drains, and exceeds the yield capacity of bars. And we get some vertical off. So these, those slabs are going up. 
high velocity flows uh, impact, what I say, impact the offset, increasing the uplift force beneath the slabs, removing the slabs. Next step for us in this failure mode is going to look something like this. This uh, high velocity jet, oh, I forgot to mention, this is um, a, a snapshot that I took from a CFD output that we did and just tried to uh, superimpose it on this model to try and show where this high velocity jet is and how it would actually impact the baffles. When it does, then we have this hydraulic jump occurs here and then tail water would rise up to here. So sorry, I forgot to mention that. But anyways, high velocity flow would, would remove these guys and all of a sudden it's gonna impinge down here in the foundation and begin to erode our shale. The next step in the failure mode would look something like this, where most of the slabs or all of the slabs are gone and we begin this back roll of erosion which begins to erode backwards towards the monolith and be begins to remove that passive wedge. Once enough of that passive wedge is removed, then we have sliding that would initiate on the bottom, that horizontal bedding plane that goes from the heel essentially out flat, um, and that's where sliding would initiate. Okay, so um, we talked about it a lot. It's kind of a difficult thing to evaluate for us because the um, the flow conditions are difficult to predict and they're hard to analyze and we've we kind of talked about why that's a problem. So I wanted to show a picture. This is a, a flume that uh, the Erdic folks have down in Mississippi and we built a model of Keystone. It's the acrylic portion up here. This is about two or three foot wide uh, flume. It's metal um, and then we get to basically remove and replace and modify different things in the stilling basin to see what effect it has on the flow conditions. So in this example, the pool is at 766. We've removed all the baffle blocks. I believe that ENSO, we had an ENSO, which I didn't mention before. It's still in place. It was part of the like permanent acrylic model, so we couldn't get that out of here. And then all of the rock down here is like a surrogate to, to try and represent what the shale would be, and this is a this is a whole other talk on how we <laughs> arrive at what the size of that gravel is. But anyways, that's what it's intended for. And so, who, who do we have a lot of people in the group? Got some water folks. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you. We're gonna watch this video here, and I want to try and like pay attention to this area right right in here. And then we'll, we'll kind of do a little discussion about what we see and, and how we can kind of use that to think about what the power of um, the water is. Let's see if it actually plays here. Oops. I promise it's a little longer. Well, maybe not. I might need some help, but we'll see. Should we watch it again? Okay, so now you kind of see where, let's go see if I can go back here. So it's really this, this portion right in here and you can kind of see some stuff going on right here. And that's what I was trying to um, show. What do you think? In terms of, um, what do you think in terms of, given that we have, let's, I'm going to scroll back real quick, given that we have this, right, what's, what, do we, what do we think about the power of this sort of backwards rolling thing that we saw right here? Thanks. 
Is that supposed to be where the actual power block started? It's power connected. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, Joey. So his point, I think, is actually valid. I should have pointed that out. So this is not exactly the scenario that we're looking at, right? It's not the same flow condition. But what I was trying to get at is there's some kind of a back roller effect, and you see that a bunch of these rocks start to like migrate. So the erosion begins kind of right here, and then it sort of steps back a little bit. And you can see some of those rocks get picked up and flicked in the flow. But it's a heck of a lot less than what's going on down here. So a big component of the energy is going downstream and sort of impinging on that rock that's, you know, further downstream. And then there's a, a smaller component of the energy that goes into that back roller. It's, I don't know if the water people want to comment on that because I'm way out of my lane. Do you agree with that? Or? Yeah, it's basically creating an eddy in the flow rather than that, which you see on the surface, it's creating an eddy in the flow. That's where all the, that's where the scours can be. Yeah, the movie's just being thought of in the plays. That's it. Okay. So now we're going to step through some properties of rocks. Um, and, and this is really uh, the, I, I was the lead geologist, I guess you could call me that, maybe. And it was my job to present some information to the risk assessment team to help evaluate the, the possibilities that we were going to have this erosion occur. And of course, we never are going to have enough holes. This is an active spillway. So it was very uh, almost impossible to get any drilling work done in it. Um, and all of the evaluation that we did was based on existing data. So we re really don't have like a opportunity to go out and drill a and dig trenches in a spillway or something like that, right? Because there's a flow going through it. Anyways, so we started with a geological map. For reference, these are the overflow monoliths in this box here. This would be the stilling basin slabs area in the lower one. The orange color up here is a, is a shale foundation. That would be the heel of the dam back here. The toe uh, of the monolith was going to be out here. This is all the slabs. The blue color is the sandstone. Probably the next most important thing to, to highlight here is these fault zones, which are in red dashed lines. There, there's two of them here. They go upstream, downstream. A smaller one here on the left abutment, and a set of two more smaller ones here. Uh, also, uh, well, I, you can probably not see them, but all, these purple lines are all of the uh, fractures that were mapped in the sandstone. It turns out that the sandstone was a much more brittle rock, and so they were able to detect those kinds of fractures and map them. And for some reason, they did not have any fractures in the shale, which is not true because there's plenty of pictures of them. I think they just did not um, map them because maybe they were more difficult to see. I don't know. So the next thing that was important to us was to understand the, the geometry of the foundation excavation. This is um, basically created from a whole bunch of points digitized from a whole bunch of maps. It was important for us to try and understand the, the places where we had you know, deep excavations, bumps, ridges, because when all of these slabs are removed, it's important to know what the geometry of the surface looks like because it impacts things like turbulence and how the flow condition will develop. Kind of the most interesting thing is this thing in the middle here. Uh, it was a, this excavation, this over excavation resulted from, well, in the 60s when they were doing this excavation, they came across this fault. I did not think they really recognized how extensive it was at the beginning. And so when they found it and, and found that it was more problematic, they hired a consultant review board to come in and, and give them some advice. The advice was to drill a bunch of holes, and, and mostly what they were worried about is horizontal bedding planes and other things that affected stability, not so much erosion. And so that's interesting to me because they did this huge hole and replaced the entire thing with concrete, which was to make stability better. 
for some reason, they did not remove any of the fault material that was up near the surface. So they just left that in place with like minor surface uh, treatments. They over excavated a small amount and backfilled with a little bit of concrete. But for the most part, these faults are still exposed on the surface. Okay, so now this is kind of the answer. I put it up front um, mainly to give you an opportunity to see what the model looked like. This is kind of the model that I use to explain the properties of the rock uh, and how we evaluated their erosion characteristics of them, mainly so you can kind of either agree or disagree with me about the things we'll look at that went into making this. Um, in general, I just split it up into three zones zones of rock, and this is all about erodibility characteristics. So zone one rock, which is everywhere uh, outside of these black and blue boxes, which is a majority of the foundation, which is our good rock. So I said about 50% of the basin um, consists of zone one. It's described as blocky, more massive, intact, pretty good rock. It has a GSI, a geological strength index from 55 to 70 kh, which is Annadale's kh, by the way. 250 to 700, so pretty high. Zone two, I said, was everything that is associated with um, these black outlines here. So zone two is the rocks that's sort of associated with these faulted areas. Um, we, we read a lot of papers that talked about all of the rocks that were above faulted areas were somehow deformed somewhat. They didn't really characterize it for us, but they said deformed. So anyways, I said, okay, 30% of the basin is very blocky, thinly bedded, easily, which we have a lot of photographs of, medium rock quality, GSI 40, 40 to 55, H of 70 to 250. And then zone three is the faulted rock. So it's everywhere inside these blue areas, a little bit smaller, but it includes most of the main uh, early central portion here, a little bit of here, and two spots over here. I said that was poor rock quality, and it has a GSI 25 to 35, and KH less than 70. So hopefully, um, yeah, so next we'll um, talk about how we arrived at, at those that sort of properties and that description. So the first thing we did is we just put up, actually, I want to point out where section B is. Section B is this guy right in the middle. So we're going to look at section B a couple of times. So section B, uh, again, with the CFD modeling overlaying, that's a high velocity jet, comes down, hits the baffle blocks, hydraulic jump goes up. First thing we did was just literally like put everything onto a cross section and tried to just highlight some stuff. So in this picture, you, I do not expect you to read anything other than I'm just highlighting a couple of red lines where we see faults and soft zones. So this gives us a kind of the first uh, in indication of where those zones exist and how continuous they are. Are they, you know, is this line continuous that line? Mm, maybe, yeah, probably. You know, is that line continuous of that line? Mm, maybe not as much. But these are like the first steps to get getting to um, some kind of characterization. Yikes. Um, <laughs> So another step was to overlay a bunch of other types of maps on top of our uh, foundation surface. So what I put in here, which you can't see obviously, is the um, spillway slab thickness. So we have thickness uh, that goes from 6 feet all the way up to 12 feet, so really thick slabs. But the point is to try and figure out where we have thin slabs related to faulted or poor quality rock zones. So I don't know if it's just coincidence, but six foot slabs, faulted area. Eight foot, maybe nine foot slabs, and the, you know another faulted area. It's like 12 foot slabs and 10 foot slabs, and maybe some eight foots over here are in the good quality. So that was kind of unusual. Also, we started plotting every single photograph because we kind of realized early on that the photographs were gonna be the key to trying to figure out what the quality of these rocks were gonna be, because um, we weren't gonna drill it. So then, tipping that, it's a 3D model. So I just tipped it on the side, and now this is looking like underneath the spillway slabs. And we projected all of those faults down into the ground at, 
at the you know inclination that they were mapped as. And then what this did for us was it allowed us to pick out every single hole that they drilled, allowed us to figure out where that fault might actually intercept it. So it gave us a kind of a guide of what borings to look at. So we started pulling all the borings. We said, okay, even though they didn't map a, a fault here or, or note a fault in their boring log, let's go look at those things and see if there's any indication of disturbed rock or whatever. So then this is an example of that. What I've done is I just highlighted the passive wedge in green. So that's kind of the rock that we care about. Um, we don't care about anything that's deep in here because it's really not part of this failure mode. And I just started cartoonishly highlighting where those fault zones might be. And on this graph, uh, I basically plotted curves of all different kinds of data. So in this example, I just have RQD as a curve plotted on top of the core, plotted next to a televiewer, plotted next to the lithology. So we can kind of have a beginning sense of like, what are the qualities of the rock that are near or in the faulted zones. So I don't think you can see it, but anyways, the RQD in this example goes, you know, from okay and then it drops pretty significantly there and it drops significantly there. Here we have RQD that stays high, it's the red line. So it stays high, high, high all the way through that. And it doesn't, doesn't even hit it down here. So there's no drop in RQD and no drop, really significant drop in RQD. Again, come down the red line, comes across, drop, drop, drop. So there's definitely some uh, impact from that fault on the on the RQD and the core logs that they didn't even get uh, recovery in. So this is kind of like the process of going through and finding out, you know, what are the what are the qualities? So RQD was one. There's a whole bunch of other things in here like uh, direct shear tests and unconfined tests that we plotted, just to try and develop some kind of relationship with properties and and faulted zones. Did the same thing with uh, rock mass rating. I think Todd kind of talked about what the, what this is, and it really just is including this guy down here is the main one that I want to point out. Joint conditions, so it, it looks at roughness, opening, infilling, and weathering. And so I wanted to see, you know, do we have any uh, relationship with faults and low RMR? Um, here's the green zone is the passive wedge again. Turns out there wasn't a huge impact uh, that we saw on the RMR. Uh, it ranged from 60 to 80, which is pretty high, which is pretty good. Um, but I don't know, we didn't really encounter any of the faulted zones in these holes, uh, which were drilled. I think these are 2020. So these are not in the actual zone that we care about. So that's a problem, just an uncertainty we'd had to deal with. I won't talk about this because we've seen it a whole bunch of times. The only thing I'll point out is that when we uh, plotted our Annadale uh, parameters and got KH values, we we're plotting up here. So pretty high in the scour zone. I think the stream powers that this represents is something like 450,000 CFS up to about 1.2 million CFS. So really high outflows. But nonetheless, we're up in the um, uh, scour zone. Did the same thing with the GSI, which I kind of talked about what the different GSI values were. But just for sort of visual, we were plotting up in this blocky zone with joints that are either, you know, described as good to fair, all the way down to blocky disturbed semi with poor joint condition. That would be the for the faulted. And the zone one, the good stuff is up, is up here. So Paul's that GSI method plots us up here. He actually does it a little different than um, Annadale and he, he divides his rocks or his erosion up into classes. He goes from class one to class five with that's the maximum depth uh, of erosion is 0.3 and this is a meters up to greater than seven. So with, with VSI results, we're plotting up here in that zone five. So that's that guy, you know, a lot of erosion, maybe getting into down like zone three or close to that. Still quite a bit of erosion. Okay, so now we get into, this, and, and, and one thing Todd and a couple of other people pointed out, I think, was that these methods are not really applicable 
to evaluating spillway erosion. They're just really not the right scenario that we're looking at. So they, they can be used in a risk assessment. They're not really the answer. Uh, they're just kind of a, a starting point, I believe. Uh, so we had to go a step further and look at what, what's, the, what's the sort of kinematics and geomechanics of these blocks. And so we've seen these a couple of times, these staring at things, and really it's just a convenient way to represent joints on a, um, on a, you know, a figure. And it allows you to find intersecting planes that form blocks that you're worried about. So in this case, uh, this is our face of the slope, this sort of theoretical slope uh, that would be eroding. And I found a bunch of joints that fall within this zone. Flow direction would be that way, obviously. Uh, here would be, I'm not going to get into what this friction angle means for us, but it just, it basically narrows your focus down on what you're looking for. Consult your local geologist if you need to figure out how to build one of these things. Um, the next thing I did is I just basically represented what those joints look like on a map so we could kind of get a sense of do these things exist because these this is all theory right now right this is all theoretical so the next thing we do is we kind of draw this in uh, a cartoon uh, so block one this is an example for me block one is uh, consists of these guys it was the most common uh, block that we found by uh, just the joints so here's that slope face again, and, and the block is this really tiny little skinny thing. It has like a factor of safety, I think it's on here, like really low. Basically would fall out of the slope by gravity only. Um, that's me trying to show what that back trailer would look like, like how it would attack that block. And this was a kind of a good um, way for me to show people how susceptible those blocks would be to back roll erosion, right? Is it easy to remove or is it hard to remove and people kind of got the idea like yeah that thing looks like it's just a tiny little block it may be easier to remove right compared to let's look at these guys these are other blocks that we found by that stereo net analysis which have uh you know which would be much bigger because of the way the joints are oriented and also have flatter slopes so that's a pretty flat slope and that's a pretty flat slope they would be more difficult to remove than that guy. So then we said, okay, well, heck, Damien, where the hell are those things? So we said, okay, let's look at some photographs. And here is that same map up here. The box represents where the photograph was taken. It represents the direction you're looking. So you can kind of just reference where you are on that old zone map. So, you know, zones one, zones two for the sort of semi-disturbed rock, and then zones three for the Vaulted rocks. So then what we start doing, and we start said this a couple of times, casts and molds, right? We look for the shapes mostly to prove that those blocks actually exist. So when I just started marking these out, these these triangular shapes, that guy right there, that's what we're looking for. And that represents those common blocks um, from the staring at earlier. We do this a couple of times. So in this area, now we're in that faulted or deformed zone, right? So you can see quite a bit different rock type. Basically. This stuff looks more, say, intact, maybe, versus now we're over in this area, which is, which is one of our zones that's maybe being affected by the fault. So the, the quality of the rock seems like it goes down. It's thinner bedded. These little triangular shapes that I'm drawing are more frequent. And so that's kind of the indication that, yeah, something is going on. It's changing slightly. Uh, another example, this guy is taken right in the faulted zone, that over-excavation. And when we, when we get an example of that face, these are the best sort of representation of what that eroding face would be. Like this, this guy would be the same face that we're worried about eroding under the monolith. So those are, even though it's a really difficult photo to see, is the best example that we have. And again, you can kind of see that the rock is like more thinly bedded. It looks kind of a little bit more broken up. And it's kind of subjective, but it's the best we had. Again, another one looking kind of the same direction, just another photograph of the same area. Again, really thinly bedded, parts easily. We have lots of descriptions of that. So then we get outside of that. And again, it's difficult to see 
but this back area is is just a little bit more um, intact rock. It's not quite as broken as the other photograph. Now we just flipped around, and instead of looking at the heel of the dam, which is that, that's the, actually this little guy is standing like right on the heel. This is one of the existing monoliths that's already been placed. That is the back of the dam. We turn around, and now we're looking downstream at the passive wedge. So that literally is the, the horizontal bottom of the passive wedge. It slopes up. And you can see that the rock improves. It becomes better, like not quite as thinly bedded, um, a, better, a little bit better quality. OK, so now we just, I'm going to skip through a few of these. This is one of the fault zones that they over excavated. And that was sort of the treatment that they did in the sling basin. So remember I was saying they didn't over excavate really anything and do similar to what they did up here. They didn't do that same treatment. They just over excavated that much and poured concrete. This was another weird one for us, uh, drainage system problem. So we were, we were wondering, so if Dan, you said, um, you think uh, stilling basin slabs are going to have uplift pressure problems, pushing up, getting those things into the flow. You know, why do you think that's going to be an issue? And this is why. So we have this weird drainage issues that they, they kind of stepped this drain, this half round pipe, as the way to connect all their drainage system. And this is mainly through those faulted areas. So everywhere they had some kind of disruption in the bottom excavation, they didn't really bother removing that stuff. They just kind of stepped over it. And so we said, oh, what's the likelihood that we're going to have problems with drainage? All right. Um, I'm going to kind of stop here and just ask this question, and, and we can kind of decide if we want to go further into this, because the, the rest of it gets into a lot of um, rock strength stuff and more of our structural. So what are we on, like, uh, time-wise? We... Let's, let's have a... So this is my uh, equivalent to a knowledge check. Well, that. <laughs> so what are some general factors affecting uh, erosion of rock? Sure. Chat them out. Don't be afraid. Keep going. Yeah. Heck yeah. Flow conditions. Rock size. I don't, yeah, I don't think I have that up there. <laughs> Weird drain. <laughs> what is it? What is it? What am I missing? Yeah, that's, I don't think I put that on there. Strength is on there. Joint spacing, block size, condition, orientation, the power. Turbulence was kind of like low, how it attacks. Angle of attack, duration, rock fatigue. Anything else from the back of the bus? All right. Others. So this is, um, I'm going gonna, gonna to actually pause here um, and just open up for, for questions on the erodibility stuff and the, and the way we presented all the, um, you know, site characterization for erosion before we decide if we want to go into rock strength stuff. Any questions on that? So does the core have a, 
characterizing the erodibility of rock. I don't know, Todd. What do you think? The question was: Does the core have any type of um, standards of how we evaluate rock erodibility parameters? Well, we have the toolboxes to go through the methods and get to our case of age or EGSI. We get those; those are standard procedures, and we kind of reference them in our toolbox and in best practices sort of things. But how we work through with those pieces of information to get to probabilities, likelihoods, rates, we have. We don't have a methodology right now. No. It's done different ways by different cadres. I've seen different. Um, I've, I've seen us try to apply it to the histograph, uh, the outflow histogram for the spillway flows. I've seen us try to, and, and then this one's this one's also unique. You're, you're linking it to the over, not the overtime, but the the flow elevation, the pool elevation, with how much back cutting or undercutting you might get. So you're kind of eliciting those factors that are compiling your table, I believe, right? So so it's judgment and it's the way that the cadre lead or the group agrees to qualify quantify the, the rotability of the rock. Does that help? So the, the problem is we there's when I was showing that earlier video of how what the power from that back roller erosion is and how much power it really imparts into the you know the undermining and backwards erosion there's not a good method to to determine what that is and so it was very uh difficult and that's why i was like uh, i don't know um no is the is the answer but uh, by looking at things like what is what is the uh, size of the blocks, like you know, how susceptible are those things to being eroded with a small amount of energy versus a lot, and then it was kind of a a, a bit of a discussion with you know other geo civils, the structural guys were in there because uh, obviously we we have to erode enough of that passive wedge to make it become unstable. Um, I think it was really difficult for us. Um, I think we, we really need to try and make a more consistent approach. I think uh, hopefully we can get there someday and we'll have some methodologies that everybody will follow to some degree. It probably won't be too restrictive because every project has different, different scenarios too that you're trying to solve. So. Yeah. Yeah, so I just want to just highlight that Damien made a key point, you know, we're, we're, you know, talking about the rock erodibility, but really when you're in the risk assessment and you're looking at these structures, particularly control structures, you know, you have to have that interaction between the hydraulics people, the geologists and geotechs and the structural people. One of the key uncertainties when we were going through the, the erosion of uh, the spillway at Prado is when the head cut gets up to the control rear, how much erosion and undermining does it take before that concrete structure becomes unstable? And then there's, you know, interactions within the structure itself where, you know, as it starts to rotate downstream, you start getting tracking at the heel and then you start getting more uh, pressure at the heel, which enhances the rotation. So it's it's really a complex problem, which is one of the reasons why it makes it so hard to standardize a methodology. Um, but it's that it's that tripartite interaction that's really critical to having, uh, you know, a good risk assessment for that particular failure mode. Yeah, and also, like, did they need their perspective, but we're talking about just looking at, at in two dimensions. It's complicated, but we have a third. Dementia. We have lateral sides. How far laterally do you have to go before you can unload the dam enough to to lose its bearing? It, it's really difficult. Yeah, um, I'm going to leave you with this. Um, this is like a 
was going to be the knowledge check question to launch into the uh, next part. The second part, which is talking about how we evaluated uh, the, the, you know, probabilities of continuity of horizontal open bedding planes, you know, C equals zero type stuff. And um, I just leave it at um, in design. I'll just ask the question, what do you guys think is the difference between risk methodology and de design methodology with respect to site characterization? Aren't they becoming more of the same now that we think we're trying to do risk based design for, like, for new designs? So uh, maybe I'll, I'll rephrase the question. Then we have a uh, design methodology that may have been done in, in before. We have somebody that came up with foundation strength parameters and they say B equals 30 and C equals zero for this. What, 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 what is really the difference between how we should approach that, that in risk methodology versus what was maybe a previous um, design methodology? Does that make sense, or am I making that more confusing? Are we making a change now? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I believe we are. A lot of times in risk assessments, we know we have more information, or we have better methods than we did during design. Yeah. There was another hand somewhere. Methodology can have more of a response rather than a creation of the design. Not always sure, but you might. What might happen? Heck yeah. So, in my mind, the biggest difference is in a in a risk methodology, you're trying to you're trying to what's the, what's the most realistic estimate for let's just talk strength parameters, right? We want to what's the most realistic uh, estimate you can come up with and put some bounds on that a high and low estimate. Versus in a des design methodology of Gerard is not quite consistent with how we are trying to go. But you, you may, you may say, um, and in the case of Keystone, they did say the most, uh, the design parameters that we're going to choose is very conservative, but we can demonstrate that we have stability even with those conservative estimates. And it didn't matter to them back then because they could still show stability. And we, the Clara, used those parameters for 60 years, you know, after construction. We couldn't get away from that because everybody was so convinced that that was um, the right numbers. But now that we can look at it from risk, risk perspective, we're moving away from it, like you said. All right. Thanks, Damien.